Uh, my, name, my name is Greg Briggs. Uh, I've been in the fire service for 35 years. Seven of those as a volunteer and 28 of those as a paid firefighter for the city of Boise. Throughout those years, I've uh, been a dive team captain, uh, doing water rescue, and then a building construction teacher. And currently, uh, I'm a captain at Boise Fire Engine 3 for another 12 hours. I've had a fair amount of life experiences in my time in the fire service. Or periodically, the fire department gives you a probationary firefighter. They give you this probationary firefighter who's young, eager, ready to get on the job, and uh, your job is to coach him through that first year and give him advice he needs. I, a lot of guys will sit him down and just drill into his head about how to pull the hose correctly, what tools he wants, uh, where to stand when you get to a house fire, how to manage an auto wreck. But I also felt that uh, there were some areas that were overlooked and areas that I thought I could maybe contribute more to as far as like life lessons and advice to carry him through his career. Not the technical aspect, but more of like the emotional, like moral aspect of getting through your career. Sometimes when probies are done with my talk, they're like, oh, I hadn't heard any of that yet. You know, I started the, like a, a list uh, years ago in the fire service of like someday if I'm captain, what do I wish I was told when I got hired into the fire service? Over the course of the last you know, 28 years, that list has grown and gotten to the point now where it's pretty much all the life lessons I think you need to know getting into it so that maybe you can uh, have a more successful career. So if you personally are getting into the fire service or you know someone that is, they can maybe listen to this and learn a couple of tidbits that will help them out. Again, these are all based on the Boise Fire Department where I worked, but I think some of them may apply to other departments and maybe even a few to life. So first lesson, write your name on everything, like on every piece of gear that you have, on your gloves, on your hood, on your mask, on your bag, on, the, on your uh, laundry sack. Write your name on everything. During your career, you're gonna change stations a lot. And if your name isn't on every single piece of gear, you're going to lose it. And once you lose it, you'll never get it back again. If your name's on it, people will actually track you down and get it back to you. Write your names in really obvious places on things like your boots, because a lot of times in the morning, uh, you know, there's a sticker inside your boots you can write your uh, initials on at least. A lot of times in the morning, someone might help you take the gear off the rig, and all of a sudden you walk out there and you see boots and you're like, oh, those, those must be mine, and you take them with you. If you have your initials and your name on it, that won't happen. And when it does happen, it'll get back to you. Along with that is, is that if it's the middle of summer and you're walking by the coat rack in the hallway and there's a whole bunch of winter coats on it, go ahead and dig through those and see if there's any names on those coats because uh, they shouldn't be out in the middle of winter and most likely someone dropped them off or someone left them there in the, in the winter time, has totally lost track of where it is and by you helping identify that stuff, we'll get it back to them if they remember to write their names in it. Tell my probationary firefighters to go if, if they have kids and like, do you know the little stickers you put on all your kids' clothes and on all their lunch boxes and things to take to school? Get, put those on your own gear. It'll look a little bit silly, but you'll definitely get your stuff back. It's a really good solution. Don't stare at every dead person. Unfortunately, throughout your career, you're going to see a lot of dead people. It's the nature of the job. You will see more dead people than you can ever imagine. Victims of car wrecks, victims of fires, victims of suicide, victims of drug overdoses. Uh, I can't even count how often we see dead people. There's a chance in your career you're going to see one of those dead people and it's going to mess up your mind and it's going to cause you a lot of grief and a lot of anxiety for the rest of your career. So my rule of thumb is what I tell people is, is that like you don't have to stare at every dead person. If you go on a call and the first person in goes obvious death and they say, do you want to come look? Don't. Your curiosity is, you're going to want to look so bad. The curiosity is totally there. You're going to want to look. But the thing you see might be the thing that somehow triggers your brain that, and you can never forget it. You know, if you're doing CPR on a child that happens to be the same age as one of your child, concentrate on your CPR. Concentrate on their chest. You don't have to stare at their face. You don't have to look around at the room and the toys and everything going on. Do your job well, but take care of yourself also. As much as you want to see what might be there, don't do it. You're going to accidentally see enough. Learn how to cook one or two things pretty well. You'll be in a fire station periodically, and every so often you're working with like a bunch of guys you don't know, and it'll be time to make dinner, and nobody will have any idea. If you're the probie and you're like, 
I know how to make such and such. Do you want me to do that? And you have the recipe in your head. They'll love you. They don't want to cook that day. They'll be very excited that you're taking care of that for them. And you can make a lot of friends quickly. Now, if you're worried about like, oh, I've never been a cook. Um, I don't know if it's going to be that good. Like I say, practice at home. Practice on your friends. And when that opportunity presents itself, take advantage of it. And you will be, even as the Lily Proby, you will be the hero for the day. Clean what is dirty and not necessarily what's on the list. You will wake up and it will be floor day. It will be the day where you're supposed to do the windows. It'll be the day to clean the rig room, whatever it might be. Great, take care of those things. Don't let them pass. But also, if things are dirty that aren't on lists, look around and find those and take care of them. Cleaning the station vents in the fire station, the ones that are on the ceiling, the returns for the furnace, uh, they can get completely <laughs> disgusting because there's not a single place on any of the lists where it says you have to clean those vents. Someone might freak out if your job is to clean the kitchen at that moment and there's something left on the counter, you're gonna freak out. But you look up and you're just like, I appreciate the probationary firefighter's attention to what he needs to do, but look around, move beyond that and, uh, and find those things. You might ask, what's the most dangerous call you're going to go on in your life? And you might think, oh, high rise fire. Oh no, it's going to be like um, someone hanging out of a third story window. At, what, so, oh, hazardous material, how about a truck with radiation? That's, to me, is not the most dangerous call. Those are the calls you go into and you're expecting to be on point and able to respond to uh, what might be ahead of you and everyone's gonna be paying attention. One of the most dangerous calls you can go on as a Boise firefighter is the medical alarm at 2 a.m. What's a medical alarm? It's the thing that the old people might wear around their neck and they push the button and when they push the button it calls the alarm company and then you go, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up scenario. Why is that so dangerous? It's because the person may not have meant to trigger that. They, the old person could have rolled over in their bed and hit that button and now it's going off. Now you are showing up to a house that's not expecting you. And when you knock on the door, no one's gonna answer it and you're going to have to go into a house and what do we have a lot of in Idaho? It's guns. And if you walk in on an old person and they just see you there and they have no idea why you're there, you could get shot. What could this also be? Suppose you're going on the person that's having chest pain and you knock on the door and no one answers. What do you wanna do? You would expect them to answer the door. There's a chance that you've gone to the wrong house. And if so, before you make any progress, try to get in that door, double check with dispatch, double check on the computer, make sure you have the right address. A lot of times you've gone to the wrong house and now you are breaking into someone's house and if they have a gun, you're gonna get yourself shot. So be very careful when you walk in, announce your presence. Say Boise Fire Department, Boise Fire Department, is there an emergency? Whatever it is, so that they can hopefully hear you before they see you. Try to be grounded when you get to a house on fire. Uh, what, here's my check. When we get to a house on fire and they tell me I have an assignment and I'm going to need to put my air pack on, I have a bag that covers my mask so it doesn't get scratched. Before I put my mask on, I take that bag and I look at it and I try to be super conscious of where I put it at in the front yard of the house. At the end of the fire, I can go back and if, that, if I can remember where that bag was, that means that I was conscious and paying attention. I was in the moment and not just running furiously. Try to make sure that you're in the moment when you get to a house fire. Another thing I like to do is, is when I am putting my air pack on, if they say, hey, stand by, you might need you for a backup line, don't be right up against the front door. Uh, back up and be like a few feet from the house. So while you're sitting there with your backup line and waiting for a possible assignment, you can see the entire building and know how the fire is progressing and where the fire is actually at. Don't be rushed, don't be panicked when you get to the fire ground. I take my bag that covers my mask and I set it down in a very particular place. And as I set that down, I think to myself, am I conscious and am I in the moment? Am I gonna remember where this is at? Then once I've done that, I'll put my mask on. And if they don't need us quite yet, I'll sit back a few feet watch the house, observe it, try to make observations and make sure I'm in the moment and not just rushing in a smoke-filled door. It's a great opportunity to learn about fires in those few minutes right before you go in where you can look around and check things out. It's good to slow down right at the beginning and observe the situation because there's thousands of details that you can take in in that moment. You can take in the positioning of the vent pipes on the roof to know where your bathrooms are going to be. You can look for bathroom windows. You can see how much smoke is being generated in the building. Is there more on the left, more on the right? Can I look at these conditions and be able to figure out where the fire is at? How many stories is it? Is there going to be a basement? 
uh, what other crews are in there. You can look at that house on fire, see how much smoke is, is coming out of the windows and out of the vents, and then when you're actually sent inside, you will see what those conditions dictate inside the building so that if you like, show up at one of those and you're the first one there, you can look up and be like, I've seen this amount of smoke, here's what I need to expect when I get in there. Here's what I can expect from my crew or how well we're gonna perform. And at the end of it, you can look at your suppositions that you had before you entered and reflect back on, are they, were they accurate to what I thought I was going to have? And by doing that hundreds of times in your career, you will become a much better firefighter. The next one is invest. You're a new firefighter, your career's just started, and you cannot even imagine being retired. But when you entered elementary school, did you ever think that you were going to be graduating from high school? As quick as that time frame goes, so will your career. So when you get into this career, uh, you, will have a, you will have some type of retirement, hopefully, uh, but also make sure you invest into your 401k, into your 457, whatever your department has. Do that uh, as early as you can. Uh, investments return on an exponential growth curve and the quicker you can start that curve growing the the better you'll do at the end by an exponential factor so when you get on I know as a probie you don't make any money at all and it's really hard I'm not saying right now you need to start putting all your money away but as soon as you can especially when you get your first year raise your once you get off probation and then your firefighter 2 firefighter 3 driver, take a percentage of those and put them away and invest them. You'll always spend whatever money is left over in your checking account every day, but if it's pulled out ahead of time, you will learn to live on that amount that you uh, have deposited. They don't teach enough about finance when you're in high school or probably even college sometimes, but really put it away. I tell, uh, <laughs> I tell a lot of people when I have an idea, I'm like, I will give you my, you can kick me in the nuts guarantee. Meaning that if you hit your retirement age and all of a sudden you say Captain Briggs was wrong, I saved too much for retirement, you can come and kick me in the nuts and I will totally let you. So that's my guarantee I do offer. So yes, invest, start early. You'll appreciate yourself later. That's a, my legacy I can give to you right now. In the Boise Fire Department, you're probably only going to have your dream job once. If, you, if you've always wanted to be a truck captain, let's say, you can't spend too long as a hoseman. You can't spend too long as a driver. You gotta have to become a captain so you can start the, building the seniority for that. Uh, I chose to be a truckman running as firefighter on the truck. And I got to do that for like 16 years and it was wonderful. But once you start moving past that position, you'll never be senior enough to have that position again. So if you've always wanted to be the captain of a certain station in the city, start looking and see how senior that guy is that has it now and start working backwards in your career and realizing how many years you have to be a captain to get into that place and uh, plan well ahead of time. I know you're just a probationary firefighter. You don't have to do this for at least about three or four more, three years, two years, but start thinking about it so that you will have that opportunity. Don't stay at a fire station where you're not happy. You will get assignments and you'll think it's gonna be the best assignment ever. It might be your dream station. And you get there and you realize you don't get along with the crew or you don't like the station. You get to the point where you don't like coming to work. That should not be happening. If you're in a station, no matter how much you love it, no matter how much you always wanted to work downtown, let's say, if you're there and you're not happy, go to a different station where you'll be happy. Uh, I made some decisions early in my career and I stayed at stations where where I could just remember going to work was, I didn't look forward to it in the morning. I knew I was going to work and it was just going to be grueling. It could have been a symptom of the times when people didn't care about their firefighters too much. Um, but I wish at that point I would have just left and gone to an engine. I really wanted to work on the truck, but I wish I would have just gone to an engine and found people that I like to be around because there's plenty of those places out there. So yeah, don't, if you go to work and you're unhappy, you, you need to change that somehow. That kind of ties in a little bit to, um, it's sometimes hard to leave a station. A lot of times you'll be like, oh, I don't think I wanna work at this station. I'm gonna go ahead and just check it out for a few months and see if I like it. And you get there and after like two months, you realize it's not your cup of tea and you're going to leave. It's kind of like having a girlfriend where you're like, I don't necessarily think I wanna date her, but I'll just, I'll just tell her we're dating now and I'll check it out for a while. If I don't like it, I'll just tell her no, that uh, it, it didn't work out, I didn't like it that much as, as much as I thought. 
Same thing with a fire station. You'll get in there and all of a sudden it's hard to leave a little bit. When you leave, it's like the captain will feel a little bit bad and be like, oh, like what did I do? Why is he leaving me to, to go to another station? Uh, you feel a little bit of attachment. It's awkward to get out of there. You know, you've kind of augured in. I'd say it's better to stay swinging, moving from station to station until you see something that you really like versus just grabbing the first opportunity. Now, if by chance you want to just test a station out, go in there, but let it be known to everyone you work with and to that captain being like, hey, I'm giving this a two month trial and I'm just gonna see if it's my thing. I'm totally planning on leaving after two months. And let the captain know that. And uh, that way when you leave, he doesn't take it personally. And make sure you share that opinion with other people in the department so they don't think like, oh, Captain Briggs, wow, his husband left after two months. He must be horrible. Let other people know why you did it and it'll be good for everyone. Read books. You're gonna have a lot of downtime in the fire station. It's just a byproduct of it. Try to find books and read them. You might be like, oh, I really don't like reading books. And if you don't like reading books, what I have a feeling is, is that you've had the wrong books. There are books out there that are great and, they're, um, and, and there's one out there that will work for you. Ask around, like the, the um, algorithms on Amazon are so good. They can totally help you find a book that you're interested in. Try a few. If you start a book out and you get four chapters, five chapters in and you don't like it, well, just get rid of that one and try to find a better one. Why? Because you learn a lot from reading versus just like doom scrolling on the internet. And it's also a great way to come down at the end of the day. You know, you're probably gonna be spending the night at the fire station. You worked your first 12 hours, it's eight o'clock at night. A lot of guys will like turn to their phone, they'll turn to the TV, and all of those things are designed to keep your brain engaged and keep you up. And a lot of people have sleep issues. They will like not be able to fall asleep. I'm like, well, what did you do to try to fall asleep? Well, I just was on my phone for a while, and never fell asleep. Get a book. It's a great way, my wife calls it sleep hygiene. Like when your book comes out and you start reading it, it's your body telling you it's time to, to get ready for bed and, um, and do that. I think you'll, appreciate having done that. I always tell my probies, like, if you can't think of a book you want, let me know. Tell me what your interests are. I will find a good one for you. We'll get you started. We can go from there. And I'll buy my probies books um, when the opportunity presents itself. But really, a great habit to carry throughout your career. You're going to love it. Every house has cameras. If, if they don't have cameras, at least assume they have cameras. Back in the day, like we could be there for a 90 year old lady who wasn't really that conscious and she was living by herself and we're just getting her out loaded on the fire truck. I would sometimes use that opportunity to like look at her house, check her smoke detectors, walk through, make sure that the house, that her living conditions are good in case she needs help, for someone to help her out. The problem is though, nowadays people have cameras everywhere, maybe to keep an eye on grandma. And when they see you walking around the house, they will, might assume the wrong intentions, that you weren't checking for smoke detectors, you weren't doing all these other things, that you were just kind of creeping around the house and they don't necessarily, they might not really appreciate that. You have to realize that when we're in the house, if they have security cameras, it's kind of a big deal. And the family will be like, whoa, the fire department was there. Let's look at the footage. It's not gonna be one of those shots that gets, gets passed over. So be careful about what you do not that you're gonna be doing anything wrong, but it's just how it's going to be perceived by people looking at you. Stay very task focused. Also when you're talking during a call, if the person is code blue, we call it, where they're not breathing and unconscious, if it's an old person, sometimes, you know, sometimes there's humor thrown around to help us cope through the situations. Just realize that there could be cameras that are recording audio also. Keep that in mind just so you don't have one of those horribly awkward moments that is misperceived or listen to somebody that isn't in the same headspace as we are on this, in those situations. Uh, wear, wear earplugs. Like wear earplugs anytime it's loud. If it's loud enough that you have to raise your voice, get earplugs in. Especially in training, when you're like running saws or working on the rig and things or mowing the lawn. There's times you can't wear earplugs. There's times where uh, we have to run a saw on a roof and we don't have time to deal with it. Uh, things are going quickly and we need, to be, we need to make that sacrifice. And we're losing our hearing for a just cause that's going to happen. But you have to look at your hearing as being like, you being born with like a 55 gallon drum of, that's filled with water. And every time you have an exposure, you lose a little bit of the water out of that drum, no matter how small it is. Use, use that hearing loss in times where there was no other options. But when there is an option, and you can take the time to put earplugs in, 
put them in. I keep earplugs in every single one of my pockets, a little plastic package of earplugs, in nearly every one of my pockets in my coat and my pants. And when I need a pair, I can always grab for it. I generally have one in my right front pocket, but just in case I have spares everywhere, so I can give those out too. You go on these automatic alarms and you're there for a half hour and they're deafening. And with all the noise, earplugs do a couple things. One, they save your hearing, and two, they don't distract you. I can't concentrate on cutting a proper saw cut when I have you know, the 115 decibels screaming into my ears from the saw. I do much better when I can eliminate the sound and look at that. Be your captain's filter. If we go on a house fire and we show up in the middle of the night and people are running up to the rig screaming at us, I need a, a minute or so to get my assignments made on the radio before I can step out. Best thing you can do for me is to go out, talk to those people, figure out what information is important, and when I step down, get that person to me. When I'm managing the radio, I don't have time to talk to everyone. Your assignments are very few for the first few moments of that fire. Be a filter for me. Tell me who the person is I need to talk to. Say things like, do you live here? If they say yes, that's a good person. No, you don't. Do you know the people that live here? Is the person lives here or around here? Get me in touch with that person and we will then go from there. Don't tell stories of your worst call ever. A lot of times you'll be around Thanksgiving You'll be with friends that are in the fire service and they will say things like, wow, you must see a lot as a firefighter. What's the worst thing you've ever seen? And the worst things we've ever seen are really bad things. We get paid a lot of money so people do not have to see those things. I don't even tell stories about those things. So if they ask you, What's the worst thing you've ever seen? Just say, I get paid a lot of money so that you don't have to know what those are. And then you can tell them cute stories about rescuing cats and ducks and things like that. And a really good reason not to show those stories are that two people don't need to hear it and you need to forget it. So eliminate that and don't keep retelling it. Take pictures. <laughs> you've got 30 years here. People don't take many pictures. Like, I'm not saying like take pictures of like personal stuff or on calls where you get in trouble where it's not that good, but around the station, take pictures of your locker, of the rigs. If you see, you know, if you're with your crew, ask them and you're coming back from, um, you know, a high rise operation and uh, there's a bystander say like, hey, would you get a picture of me and my crew? Just do it. Those pictures are going to be so valuable. If you see another crew, grab their cameras or grab their phone and be like, let me just get a shot of you guys. Take pictures of all the mundane stuff, what your food bag looks in the morning, like what a run report screen looks like. You're gonna have a lot of time here, but when it's time to retire, it's gonna be gone. And really the only thing you're going to be able to take with you are your memories and your photos. So please over, overdo it, take a ton, all the time. I tell my probies, I want them to take at least five pictures a day as part of their probie assignment, just to try to get them in the habit of it. I don't know if they do or not. I take a lot of pictures of them. I'll be sending a whole bunch of those out here. I'm not retired. Use your downtime wisely. There are some busy houses where you're running calls the entire day, but there's also a lot of stations where you have downtime. You have Saturdays and Sundays where there might not be scheduled training. If you add up the hours that we have as downtime, it's gonna be in the thousands of hours throughout your career. You are going to have enough time to be great at anything you want to be great at. If you wanna pick up a foreign language, you could do it. You could be fluent. If you wanna learn how to play the guitar, you could do that too. If you want to learn how to do web design or if you want to become a great writer, the downtime is there to do it. I have a list on my phone that I look at every day before I come to work about something that I either want to learn about or some little project I want to do. Challenge yourself by doing things outside of the fire service. When I hired on, I had been a river guide for a number of years. I still loved going out with my friends river guiding. Uh, I liked elk hunting. I liked mountain biking. I liked... Uh, I even, I even led a Burning Man camp. When I became captain, if the only skills I had about how to manage a crew at a fire was from the amount of times I had been on a crew at a fire, I would not have developed the skills. Let's say I'd been on 100 fires and I probably learned something really good about 50 of those. 50 lessons is not enough to know how to manage a crew and to uh, perform well under stress. I worked as a paddle boat guide for a river company. And I'll tell you what, that it gave me an opportunity to work with a bunch of other people going through a stressful situation and exiting the, the rapids uh, successfully. 
The cruise back there used to say, Briggs, you're not paying enough attention to your work. You shouldn't be going on all these vacations. You need to stop taking time off. You need to be here learning your job. I'll tell you what, all those times on a river where we had boats that washed away and we had to figure out how to pull this whole trip together and make it work, those are, were all great experiences to teach me how to work well when, when it's going wrong and how to manage people in stressful situations. And even the little stuff inside the station about how to deal with um, inter, inter, uh, interpersonal matters there. So all those guys that said, no, don't do anything, the fire service should be your life. Pay attention to the job, be good at your job, but you're gonna need other opportunities to gain the skills you need to to survive the next 30 years. Take time out for the old retirees who visit the station. Well, this might be sounding completely self-serving because I'm going to be a retiree in just the next day, but do it. When they come in there, you might be in the middle of like checking out the rig, or you might be there cooking dinner, you might be in the middle of a movie that you, you and the crew are watching, or reading a book even, and it might be like, who is this guy? I have no idea who he is. He said he worked here, he had a career here. Um, yeah, sir, what are you doing? Dropping off some cookies? Okay, great, thanks, bye. If you find out he's a retiree, bring him in there and recognize that. He spent more time than you did in this station with this department and he holds a lot, by him simply coming by, means that he values the fire service, he values the fire station, he values the crews working there. Return that to him. Don't take that away from him that he's nothing now. So if he comes and visits, bring him in. Ask him to tell you a story. Ask him if he wants to see the rig room. That might be only once or twice as a retiree that he visits a station. And just thank him for laying the groundwork to have created the fire service that you can be a part of today. Know the schedule in the morning. So I know it's not your job to know what our plan is for the day, but it's always appreciated if the probie has looked at the training calendar, looked what we have going on for the day, and can be able to engage in that conversation. Or if he happened to get to work early, open the schedule early and realized, oh, we got assigned a class at 8 a.m. It's great when the captain comes in if the probie just says, hey, Cap, just so you know, we have a class at 8. I checked out the schedule. I'm like, wow, he is paying attention. He's already trying to develop as a leader and it can really save my butt when that happens too. Because every so often I will come in and be dealing with an issue in my inbox, completely forget to look at the training calendar. Keep the rig ready to respond to emergencies. Let me give you this scenario. You're checking out the medical kit on the, on the tailboard of the truck and uh, you're halfway through it and the phone call comes in. What do you do with the med kit? Do you leave it there while you check the phone and say, let me make sure I remember to get the med kit off? Well, let's just say while you're on the phone, all of a sudden a house fire comes in just down the road and you run onto the rig and jump on because now you realize, oh my gosh, I'm a probie firefighter and I'm getting a house fire. And you drive away and all of a sudden now you have a med kit spread out across several blocks and you're stuck at a fire and you are going to, it's going to be really, really bad for your career. Let's say you open the compartment because you want to check out your air pack. And so you work, go over to the ground and start working on it with the compartment door open. I always do things like close the compartment door, work on my thing, so in case while I'm doing that, the driver decides he wants to pull the rig out to check something. He doesn't rip the compartment door off. So uh, it's okay to open those doors and be there while they're open. But the moment you disengage from that, close it up, take the stuff off the bumpers, uh, and uh, you'll be better off. When I worked at Station 6 years ago, uh, we, uh, we pull, when we left for a call, we'd pull out and immediately turn off onto Franklin Street. and about once a year I would go out to the far side of that turn and pick up all the coffee cups out there that had been dumped off the rig by fire trucks that had left. So, um, yeah, don't be that guy. <laughs> don't let the captain or the chiefs pack the bundles. And what that means is, is that your job as the hoseman is to be responsible for those hoses. You probably look at us captains and, and these officers and think they know everything. They're the smartest people I know. Periodically, we're not that good at loading a pre-connect because it's changed a lot since we were probies. If it's a high-rise bundle, we might not know exactly how it goes together. If you walk up and you see, you've, and you've been doing your probie drills and you have three captains down there trying to put a high-rise bundle together and you look like it's going a little bit wrong, don't think you're offending them by going, hey, would you guys like me to take this over for you? I'm a probie, I should be doing this for you. The last thing the captain wants to see is like him being unable to do that with a probie behind him. It's, it would be a little bit embarrassing. So get down there and when you see them doing this stuff, help them out a little bit. Don't turn your back on a rig that's driving in reverse. If you are backing a rig and it's coming towards you, 
you can look over your shoulder as to where you're going, but keep your eyes on that. If it's going quick, you can turn and look over your shoulder at it, but don't take your eyes off of it. You, you don't need to be run over by a fire truck. When I'm backing, be hyper vigilant, super aware of your surroundings so that you don't get hit. A lot of times there'll be two people backing the rear. You might not even know it. There may be a guy over on one side backing, you on one side, and he might not even be looking at you. So be careful. It's a quick way to get a really bad injury. Track the stations you work at throughout your career. When you can, get yourself a sheet and just put it in your locker as to the dates when you were at the station and who was on your crew. And transfer that throughout your career from locker to locker and keep track of that stuff. You're going to forget and you're going to not be able to quite remember when you worked and who you worked with. And by the end of your career, if you've kept track of it, you'll really appreciate that document as kind of like the little ledger of what your accomplishments were while you were at the department. Keep back from the weird stuff, meaning that if you see something going on in the fire ground uh, or someone's trying a new procedure that looks a little bit sketchy or they're climbing on a ladder carrying stuff that looks like it's not balanced that well, stay back from that, from that stuff. Basically, I've been ahead of these situations where we had someone like climbing the ladder. I was pretty new on the fire service. Someone was climbing a ladder and we were learning how to climb the ladder carrying our tool belts on things. And we were standing underneath the ladder. And I just kind of like looked at the instructor. I was like, oh gosh, I just don't know if we want to stand here. Maybe we should step back a little bit. And um, we did and we were still having a conversation. And what actually ended up happening was is the person coming down with the ax in their belt their axe got caught on a rung, and as they were climbing down, they were holding on just gripped as they were coming down the ladder. The axe got lifted up out of their belt, fell off, and went free falling off the ladder truck. It crashed into the top of the ladder truck and dented the diamond plate, and uh, I was fortunate. I don't know if it would have hit me directly. It would have been within inches of me, but it just says that if you're in a dangerous position and you're not helping the situation or helping with the rescue, back off because when things go wrong, you don't want to be around. Uh, as they say in hazardous materials, if you, or if you double your distance away from uh, like radiation, you only get a quarter of the exposure. So keep your distance. Now, if you're, now there's going to be times where you're actively involved in the process and you're the one that's going to make the difference, in which case you have to take that risk. There was, there's three different times this happened to me. And um, one of the times was is that they wanted, they wanted to test the pressure relief valve on the truck. And so they decided like the pressure relief valve is supposed to be triggered when you have a hydrant with too much water in it. And when the water comes in, it starts dumping water so you don't overpressure the rig. So they took the, we didn't have a hydrant with enough pressure. So what they did was is they took a discharge hose and off the pump and ran it around to the intake on the pump. And they started bringing the pressure up to see if they could raise the pressure in the system up high enough to cause a discharge to activate. Well, they were raising the pressure higher and higher and it's something I'd never seen done before. And I was kind of sitting there watching, but then I was just kind of like, this looks a little bit weird. I stepped back and started walking away. And all of a sudden I heard this massive explosion behind me. And the pressure intake valve, which is probably two feet by one foot by one foot, came flying off the rig at about 40 miles an hour with the hose still attached to it and blew past me in the parking lot and skipped along the ground and ended up hitting the curb on the far side. Those valves are held on by uh, bearings so they can be rotated. It's kind of like when you put a coupling on it, it'll swivel. Well, those swivels, they aren't round bearings like we're used to seeing. They're actually little uh, discs. And there was a whole bunch of those discs that were holding that manifold onto the rig. And when it, when it blew, it blew so hard that it chopped every single one of those bearings in half. And throughout the parking lot, there were these little half moon pieces of metal scattered everywhere. Uh, it turns out like as pumps work, a centrifugal pump can take advantage of the pressure coming back into it and they add pressure in the system. And every time the pressure comes back around, it ramps it up again and creates this like uh, vicious cycle of a pressure indication, like a runaway pressure uh, or runaway uh, pressure situation. So as, the, um, as they started bringing that pressure up, it immediately sent 100 PSI out of the pump, worked its way, worked its way around, came back into the pump and then bumped it again 100 PSI, shot it out around again, another 100 PSI, until eventually the system had a pressure that was capable of like breaking metal. The last one was, as we were on a, we were doing hose testing. Back in the day, we used to do, we used to hose test a little bit recklessly. And we had all of our hoses lined up off the pump and we were bringing them up to pressure to see if they were going to fail. We had uh, our 
cap or we had a person in charge of the testing that was kind of walking between all the hoses and we were standing there two with him uh, watching him as he was like looking for leaks and such and kind of realized we weren't really helping the situation at all so I'm like well why be around all these hoses that are getting pressure tested let's head out of the area and we headed out probably about 50 feet away as we did it as we were watching it I still remember him watching with his clipboard one of the hoses exploded came across and hit him in the legs uh, dislocated both his legs, he flipped over, landed onto his um, head, and then got a closed head injury. And we had, I remember just trying to hold him down as he was violent because he couldn't really control himself. But he flipped on his head, got a closed head injury, and became super agitated and aggressive. We had to hold him down and get him to the hospital. Uh, he was at, in the hospital for, I think, a month. So it's just that ability to like see something dangerous, realize, Am I helping the situation? And if not, just back up, give it some space so if something goes wrong, you aren't caught up and taking an unnecessary risk. A lot of it comes with experience to like definitely know, I can see this going bad, I know how it's going to go bad. Early on in your career, you might just have a sense of like, this doesn't seem right, this is something I never tried before. If I don't know the answer as to whether I'm in a safe spot and I'm not helping, why not just back away a little bit? My last one is, it says sleep is good, which is something, it's like not necessarily what I want the whole public to have to see, but we get our asses handed to us a lot and uh, too many people like don't realize how important sleep is to get you through your career. Like sleep is so important. I always say like, there's nothing I can do as a captain to make you a better firefighter today than having you just take a quick nap before we get going for the day and to try to get your head about you. It's okay to go to bed early to get those hours of sleep in, especially if you're going to be up a few times in the night with calls. But take care of yourself. If you're exhausted, make sure you know that and get your naps in whenever. It's a great career. It's not for everyone. But for some, it's, it can be a perfect fit. Uh, I spent a lot of years, saw a lot of stuff, had a lot of fun, had a lot of disasters, uh, but here I am at the end of it, and I'm just so happy to still feel healthy, to have a great family. Uh, you know, I talked earlier about making sure you learn or make sure you take time outside of work to do things to teach you the skills you need on the fire ground. Also, when you do things outside the fire service, you gain a second family too. People that when you hit the end of your career and it's over, uh, they will be the people that you can be around that will still value you and uh, that you can also value and, and still have a good place in the world. It's pretty scary leaving, getting out of the fire service. Like everything you knew, all the skills, uh, all the excitement and all the value you found in it are going to slowly fade away. In fact, they might fade away pretty quick. Uh, just be ready for that. But. If you're considering a career in the fire service, I would at least check it out. It's pr pretty good. Um, you won't get rich, but you will, uh, if you put the effort into it, you'll be rewarded with a, with a great life.